You're listening to Health Innovators, a podcast and video show about the leaders, influencers, and early adopters who are shaping the future of healthcare. I'm your host, Dr. Roxy Mooney. Welcome back to the show, Healthcare Innovators. Today, I have Frank Ricotta with me. He is the CEO of Burst IQ. Welcome to the show, Frank. Oh, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. So I usually have our guests start off by telling us a little bit about their background, and you can certainly do that. Um, But I want to kind of start off just a little bit different. How are you changing the world? How are we changing the world? That's an awesome question. I mean, one of the, you know, kind of one of our foundational premises uh, about Burst IQ is that we really wanted to impact the, the whole, the whole problem of health access and equity, but at the same time, really empower people with their, with their own data. I mean, there's so many people in the world just don't have access to health care and, and, and basic health services, uh, even, even more that have, uh, have no real um, documented identity, as an example, and, and access to financial services. So we, we wanted to take a run and try to solve some of those problems. And so you started the company six years ago? Yeah, in the spring of 2015. Almost six years. It doesn't seem that long. Uh, <laughs> when you start thinking about it, it's like time well, flies. What has that journey been like for you? Um, you know, start, start, startups have their really, you know, these highs and these really low lows at, at some point in time. And, um, you know, when we started started the company, uh, nobody, nobody even heard of the term blockchain. We use blockchain technology through the platform yep. uh, to enable some of our security services. But, it was it was somewhat like living a Dilbert cartoon, you know, blockchain. What I don't know what that is, and I don't like some of the other tech that emerges. Cloud, you know, are you going to put your data in the cloud? Yeah, I'm going to put my data in the cloud. I don't know what that means. And so we started we started down that path and had a big education ramp, um, and people started trying to drive us into a, you know something that we didn't necessarily we were good at doing, but didn't necessarily want it to be our core business, and that was. You know, anal- you know, basic analytics and, and data, and uh, and so in mid two thousand and seventeen, we decided, hey, let's just rebaseline the business, and we we turned off a lot of our um, contracts at the time, or, or kind of wound them down, successfully delivered them, and rebaseline the business, so went back to ground zero, and um, it was uh, it was a a pretty traumatic decision at that point in time, but a good decision, I think. Yeah. So, you know, just explain what that was like. I mean, that had to be a very difficult decision to turn down business and risk, you know, everything that you had built so far and going in a completely different direction. Yeah. You know, you know, what I found was that I just, I was, I was actually, I could, I know exactly where I was. So I was walking, walking um, down, you know, down one of the streets in New York city. It just, uh, just finished, uh, talking with a potential investor and I was saying, you know, we're just not really happy. I mean, this isn't, this isn't floating my boat. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not feeling we're really accomplishing what we set out to accomplish with the yeah. original premises. And I took a step back and I know that there, there's different ways that people talk about it. What's your why, you know, what's your massive transformative purpose. And I, I went back to the hotel room and kind of wrote a, wrote a little two page or two, uh, to my team and particularly my co-founder and said, you know, let, let's get, let's reconnect back to what, what gets us excited. And when we, it was hard to make the decision because we knew it was going to be a little tough for the next few months, you know, particularly making payroll, we were self-funded and, yeah. um, but once we did it, it, it was like a burden was lifted. We, we were able to, to really re-energize lots of aspects of the business and that, that really, turned it around from there. We got a couple of cornerstone clients pretty quick and quicker mm-hmm. than we thought. And um, I've really been on that journey since. Worth the risk. Yeah. Definitely <laughs> worth the risk. Well, you know, and that's such a fascinating um, challenge or opportunity that you just described because I think health innovators face that often, um, yeah. maybe in different situations. It could be an investor that's trying to guide you in a different direction. It could be a really key customer. Um, it, you know, it could be an, a, a, a co-founder, a team member. And so really, I think, like you said, being able to document who you are and who you want to be and what you want to offer to the world right. and having that kind of as a rudder to guide you um, seems like that's going to be really important. That's right. And, you know, and you know when, you have a, when you have your what, 
you know the the how the how can can kind of sh- uh, go in different directions and shift yeah. and turn. because like you know the challenge is is stay true to your values and what you want to do but not get so focused that you missed opportunities to get there and and so that's why the how the how in in terms of how you get there um, you need to be very astute in what's happening in the market and where you know, where your open field is and, and really try to run to that open field uh, where you start seeing some adoption, what you're, what you're delivering. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I hear, you know, in my conversations with health innovators, I hear this dilemma often of how do I know when is the time to stay true to who I want to be and true to true to our course. And when am I actually listening to feedback that's really incredibly valuable feedback where I may need to pivot my business um, in juggling between nope, stay focused. They might think you're crazy, but you're on to something versus like, no, 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 no. You need to U turn, uh, abort, abort. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't always want to be the captain who goes down with the ship, that's for sure. And yeah. And that's, that's why you have, you know, it's always a bunch of market feedback. You know, I had a friend of mine once tell me is that half the battle of startups is still being there to play. And um, as I say, you can, you can grab a hold of your, your big broad vision and where you want to be and where you want to take the company. Like for us is dealing with this health equity and, um, and, and access problem on a broader basis, but then decide, okay, am I going to do it from a B2B perspective as a starting point or B2C uh, so it doesn't, you know, you don't have to compromise kind of the internal values to be successful in the marketplace. And, you know, that that feedback and that valid feedback is important. Um, not all of it's correct because everybody has an opinion um, <laughs> that you, you have to you have to be a student enough to listen and to self-evaluate on a constant recurring basis. So help us understand what this funding journey has been like for you, because you've raised, you know, some good money before the pandemic. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I'm thinking that was a big blessing for us to close, to close our Series A round back in September with Elsewhere Partners, and Elsewhere Partners been a phenomenal, um, been a phenomenal investor from the standpoint, extremely supportive, mm-hmm. um, have some extended resources that have been helpful for us, and and that's really one of the keys we had. You know, we we are on and off again looking at raising money for a year and a half. You know, we started, we raised two hundred fifty thousand in a seed round back in 2015 and had not raised any money from that point forward and, and anything of significance. And, mm-hmm. um, and for us, it was all about, can we find a good partner, not just money? Uh, yeah. just, I've been down a path where I, I've closed some, or we've been in companies or like companies we closed some investments and the investor was actually destructive and we didn't want to do that. We, you know, we were, yeah. we were, we were so focused on really somebody that'd be accretive to what we we're trying to do. And I think we found that in elsewhere. So um, what, um, what recommendations do you have for folks that are in the trenches today that are um, raising money, um, you know, um, in, in trying to weigh those options and what's going to be the best path for them and who they're going to be partnering with? What were some of those key decisions for you? Well, I, you know, investors have criteria, you know, what, who and what they want to invest in, you know, what geographic region they want to invest in. Uh, you should, you should do the same thing, you know, as an entrepreneur, you should, you should have your list of what you want from an investor, what you're looking for from an investor and, um, and pursue that. And it's not all about how much money you raise or what the valuation is. Um, there's lots of other factors that go into those kind of deals. Cause, you know, we actually had, had a couple opportunities that would have, would have um, not diluted us as much, you know, um, a little better valuation, but it just wasn't a good cultural fit for us. So you have to kind of weigh, weigh those options, but know what you want. And, and it's just not about who shows up to say yes. Mm-hmm. Um, have your own filters. And, and, and what I found over the years as well is that um, it's like, it's like anything else selling, you know, investors start getting more interest when interested when they think they're going to miss something. Um, and so you have to kind of create a little bit of that buying frenzy as well, but do so on your terms is the big thing. Mm -hmm. So how has, um, this global pandemic impacted your business? Oh, man, uh, I guess, I guess you're able to ask this kind of tongue in cheek, who hasn't it impacted? Right. Right. Yeah. There, there've been aspects in the market that, 
that have been very positive, you know, um, overall from the standpoint of more adoption of virtual care kind of techniques and uh, a greater awareness on digital identity in the form mm-hmm. of health passports and how you do business in, in the electronic space. Those have all helped us in terms of getting over some of the education, cur- education and early adoption fears. Uh, but again, we had, we had another little shift. I mean, we were really a uh, post investment. We were focused on, on a full enterprise enablement strategy and uh, that market pretty much went into a stasis period where we see most health health systems start focusing on how they're going to deal with COVID. They, you know, not a lot of new projects. Um, so we took a step back and launched an initiative called Research Foundry, really built up a lot of the data collaboration parts of the platform um, mm-hmm. and, and really created a new opening. And so we're coming out of the back end of that and we'll see if that was a good decision on, uh, on the, Uh, as it translates into revenue and business growth? Well, global health definitely is more, um, I think folks are more interested in paying attention to global health. I mean, obviously, um, more so than ever before. I think as, especially as Americans, you know, we've, we've really viewed, oh, that's happening over there. Oh man, that's terrible. And then kind of back to business as usual. And I think, you know, if I look back and one of the lessons learned is, is for, for all of us that, you know, what happens across the country, I mean, across the world uh, impacts us a lot more than we realize. Oh, yeah, it sure does. I mean, if you don't, if you haven't um, come to the realization that we're all connected, the pandemic should have done that for you. Right, right. Yeah. We're, yeah. we're in it, like, as you said, an issue in one part of the world turned into a global pan- pandemic that impacts every aspect of our lives. I mean, it's, it's been profound in many ways. Yeah. Yep. So what do you think is, um, what are some of the key decisions that you've made that have led to your success? It sounds like what you start, what you started out as has evolved over time, um, uh, to where you are today. And so as you kind of look back at that journey, what are some of the decisions where you're like, oh, you know what, that was really a game changer, whether you realized it at the moment or, um, or not. Um, well, I talked about one kind of re- rebaselining and, and it wasn't, you know, the interesting, it wasn't doing much different at the core of the technology It's really, okay, where were we going to take it at that point? So, yeah. you know, uh, looking forward and, and some aspects is there's always an immediate immediacy in front of you. And sometimes that's good. And sometimes you got to look at, okay, can I address that? Or do I have to look two to three months down the road? And I think that was a good decision on our part to really emphasize uh, some other aspects of the platform really start taking it in a different direction. It it connected us to um, the international world in many ways. It it allowed us to start working with organizations such as OECD and re- in terms of regulatory uh, guidance and both on the financial services side and the health side. It connected us back to the Department of Commerce for that strategic relationship. So it was a really good decision for us to kind of shift shift that way. And then I think. I think the second one was uh, when we decided pretty early on is to, hey, let's accelerate this data collaboration side of the platform for Research Foundry. And I just just yesterday, we actually announced the winners of a, a project we had undertaken with American Higher Association and Itachi around the data challenge for COVID and uh, its impact on minority populations and mm-hmm. announced the two winners, which is University of Michigan um, and uh, Alabama. So it was awesome. That's great. So tell us a little bit about that, that challenge. <laughs> yeah, the, the whole focus was to, to create, uh, create an innovation challenge really around data to understand, uh, broad, to understand more broad, broadly the impacts of COVID on certain segments of our population, particularly um you know, uh, less fortunate, uh, less fortunate aspects of the population, uh, minority populations, uh, such as uh, African American populations, Native American populations, and, and really, really understand why, you know, why that um, they were getting, um, getting hit harder than everybody else. Uh, And the results now, uh, I'd love to say I could summarize all the results. Um, 
they're getting pretty technical for me, but the, yeah, uh, don't worry, uh, this is not a test. <laughs> they're, they're in the process of getting peer reviewed and, and all those results are going to be published soon under the auspices of American Heart Association. So it's, it's really pretty awesome. Yeah. What a proud moment for the work that you guys are able to do. Yeah, I, I'm, it, it was, it was, uh, it was a good culmination. I'm, I'm re- I was really, really happy with that. Um, but it, you know, but the other aspect of that, which is, um, which is we, we open up the platform to, um, as you know, for free access for researchers and um, researchers and innovators. And we wanted, uh, we wanted them just to, just to leverage things we've done. Ho- hopefully, you know, to, to move COVID, COVID research, uh, faster, uh, forward and faster. But what we ended up, what ended up happening as well is we, we really energized the whole innovation community. And, um, you know, we went from, you know, 50 ish projects on the platform to well over 200 now and several hundred developers scattered around the world, really all focused on, on producing some, some really cool projects. And we've got a great team in the, uh, a great partner in Nigeria, as an example, in Australia, and they're just doing some fun and incredible things. So what do, what do you think is next? Like what's on the horizon? How do you see your platform being used in the future? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, uh, that's, that's a great, that's a great question. I mean, you had a great question. So um, if, if I had my druthers, you know, it would be kind of the next great, the next big platform. So you see all these social tech platforms, yeah. it really becomes, it becomes this kind of universal data exchange platform. And there's, there's um, some emergent, you know, there's some emergent technology that I think is going to accelerate that adoption, mm-hmm. um, particularly around the W3C consortiums um, with what is known as virtual uh, verified credentials that really begin to mobilize a lot of this kind of structured and, and verified data that we would that we curate and let you exchange it. Um, so I'd really love to see us see us be one of those platforms, with one exception. You know, I don't. We, we never want to really own and control the underlying data sets. We really value individual privacy and ownership. That's a big difference, Frank. That's a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not, not, a big fans, not a big fan of that. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, you know, when you think about the, the global impact that you and, and Burst IQ team is, is having, um, let's just talk about commercializing um, your solution in different parts of the world. Um, You know, I think that as innovators, you know, we're always looking at, um, you know, best markets that we can serve. And because, you know, most of us that are on the show in the audience is in the U.S., we have a tendency to kind of think of, um, you know, America first for commercialization and maybe some of these other markets around the world um, after the fact. But I've had a lot of conversations with folks who have had much more success in Europe or in Asia than they have in the U.S. And then they use that success to kind of come back and use that to drive the success here in their own backyard. So help us understand what that journey has been like for you. Um, well, you know, the, I think, I think a lot of our success success early on uh, really started overseas uh, because from a U.S. perspective, uh, you, you know, quite frankly, we're, we're a bit late, late to the game around blockchain, yeah. blockchain technologies. And, you know, early on, it was a lot of the cryptocurrency phases. So the SEC put a lot of roadblocks in place for companies to pursue fundraising in that capacity. And, and so a lot of the innovation started happening outside of the United States. And a lot of the really more advanced regulatory pushes and, um, and uh, friendly jurisdictions, you know, started popping up everywhere but here. Uh, and because you know we were pretty good with that underlying technology, we started getting a lot of visibility in the in these other jurisdictions, and uh, which allowed allowed some early adoption in those areas versus versus here. You know, here we had to somewhat downplay some of that and uh, you know pick up our early customers. But I think I think blockchain for us, um, you know, uh, opened the door internationally, particularly we're. We're still one of the few companies squarely focused in the health space um, with the technology and, mm-hmm. and, and have, have quite, a, quite a number of years in, in utilizing it. 
So, so my next question for you, you know, I think that I'm talking about apples and oranges here when we're talking about um, warp speed and being able to fast track these vaccinations. But I think that that as well as just many other factors with the pandemic has, has really shown probably not us as much as some of the bureaucracy that we've had to deal with that we can actually do better we can be a lot faster um, and we can do some things that maybe we thought we couldn't do for another 10 or 20 years. Um, you know, how do you think that that's going to affect um, adoption going forward? In, in, adoption in, in, in what sense? In, in, um, you know, in, 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 in any innovation, in disruptive innovation, in incremental, in reimbursement models, in you know things like blockchain, in any type of innovation that maybe we even haven't dreamt of yet, do you do you yeah. have any sense of of how like maybe this has been a, a springboard for new things on the horizon when it comes to yeah. the ecosystem that we've been kind of forced to play in for a while? Yeah, you know, um, I think I think there's two aspects. You what there there. I mean, with all, all the ugliness of, of COVID-19 and the pandemic and, and the human impact and suffering, there's been a few things that have come out that have been positive. Is one, it's broken down a lot of traditional um, traditional barriers in terms of uh, in, in inhibitions to collaborate. So work, you mentioned work speed. That's a great example of a public-private partnership that worked. And, and I think we're going to see a lot more of those kind of partnerships in the advancements of health that don't necessarily aren't necessarily confined to a geographic region or a nation state region. I, I think it set a it set a really solid precedence to how to accelerate when we put our minds to it how innovation can come to the market really quickly. Mm-hmm. And when you see things like blockchain and and those kind of technologies that's applied right as we applied it allows it allows. Um, researchers and organizations to to really stay focused on on uh, are not having to worry about am I going to get my IP compromised? Can I collaborate without without crossing this barrier? Uh, will it help still help me in a competitive space? And um, so we're seeing a lot more willingness to collaborate and cooperate, particularly at the data and data sharing uh, side of life. Um, and I think all that's a really positive positive momentum. Um, but I, I I think it was a good level set on on um, take, taking down our artificial barriers and working, working together. Yeah. I mean, I definitely agree. I think that we've leapfrogged. I mean, we've done like 10 years worth of adoption in about six months. Yep. So in, in that regard, that is a, a huge silver lining for us. And, and I'll throw another one out for you because this had, this is one of those two sides of the coin, good, good and bad side. And yeah. um, I, I think, I think the situation has really pushed this whole, the whole need, uh, need, or it's put a spotlight on the need for really solid, verified digital identity, um, and we see some, some, you know, some parts in the United States actually, um, actually starting to, um, to get behind that that notion. But from a broader sense, if you think from COVID, health and commerce have now intersected. Yeah, um, you're going to get on my airplane. Do you have your vaccine, or have you been tested? you're entering my country, are you going to be quarantined or can I allow you to come in without quarantine? So this, this ability to represent aspects of ourselves in a verified way um, as now, as now really, as really took, took root and you're going to see that grow significantly. Downside, we got to really be conscious of the privacy side of this and it, it mm-hmm. doesn't, doesn't get used for the wrong reasons. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And I think we'll probably see more and more and more of those two sides of the coin as things continue to unfold. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I think that you guys are doing some stuff that's pretty awesome and pretty revolutionary. When you think back to, um, you know, your commercialization and, and maybe in the past and now and even in the future, how are you finding those early adopters that are looking to embrace something new and innovative like your platform? Oh, um, well, you know, if you, you go, you go back to, to the whole crossing the chasm notion, I, I think when you just stay square in the blockchain space outside of crypt, cryptocurrencies and hand, and just a handful of cryptocurrencies, you know, it really hasn't crossed over that chasm in many ways. So you still, right. 
while people are more familiar with it, um, there's still a little trepidation. Uh, but what what you're what you're seeing now is that because of some of the early adopters are willing to try it and really push for forward meaningful projects and even uh, some of the consortiums that have that have pulled together that from large companies. Yeah. Uh, the support infrastructure as well as the tech the technology ecosystem has really matured quite uh, uh, quite significantly, and so now we're starting to see the first the first beachheads in the other side of the chasm where. It's not just pure early innovators. It really is the early adopters that are looking to do something new and innovative in their business or create new market opportunities. Yeah, yeah, that's great, great, great analogy, great story. <laughs> so, um, you know, you talked about how, you know, being an entrepreneur has its ups and, down, ups and downs. Um, how do you stay motivated and inspired during this journey? Oh, you know, um, Couple couple words of advice, no matter how old you are, you know, uh, get yourself a mentor and somebody you can confide in. Um, be a mentor because teaching and, and conveying what you do is helps uh, actually helps you per- grow. And then you got to have a good group of peers around you that are going to challenge you and not be afraid to to whack you in the head when need be. So that's one. And then the second thing is you, there's got you got to stay balanced. You got if. There have been times in my my life and some of my early companies it was so consumed in the companies that other aspects of my life, my health, and even in my personal relationships suffered. And yeah. so if you don't if you don't balance that whole mind body spirit side of life in in your personal, it's hard for you to be the best person you can be in your company. And um, it's worth taking those times. In fact, when you think you don't have time, um, it's exactly the time you need to <laughs> you need to take to go. Go That's meditate. the red flag, right? <laughs> I don't have time. I don't have time. Whoa, we need an intervention here. <laughs> I've been there. That's for sure. So, so who have been some of those mentors and advisors for you that's made a huge impact? Um, man, that's a, that's an awesome question. Um, you know, I've had, I've had a couple that have been steady for me over the years. Um, you know, one, one, one gentleman in particular, I mean, we're probably, he's probably going on 25 years. And when I, when I really need uh, some sound words of wisdom, I call him up and he's a retired KPMG partner. I mean, he was a oh. senior partner at KPMG. And when I stuck, when I set out to run my first company and um, one of, one of the, um, or start running a company f- uh, from a person who started a pretty sizable venture firm, start running, he, he introduced me to him. He was my temp CEO and we've been friends ever since. And I've looked to him uh, on and off over the years. And um, he's been solid. Uh, actually a gentleman who's a CEO of one of our customers now, I've, you know, I've been his customer. He's been my customer. He's been on my boards. I've been on his advisory boards. It's been a really good symbiotic relationship there. And, uh, and he's another kind of go-to person. And then my co-founder is an awesome, an awesome balance for me. And on the personal side, can't discount my wife. She keeps me level and my, and my, and both, um, I'm, I'm going to give kudos to my mom because, you know, she broke a lot of conventional norms and, um, has that entrepreneur streak in a different way. Uh, really? a great example. I mean, she's predominantly been in education, but she's been such an innovator in education has won numerous awards and up being a superintendent of a school district. She's, uh, it's an amazing lady. So I always give her kudos. You know, that's really fascinating because I've studied a lot about different successful entrepreneurs um, and innovators, and almost all of them have a great mom story. You know, you think yeah. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and, you know, on my dad's side, my, my dad's side. Taught not me, that dads weren't great also. Yeah. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> well, my, my dad always taught me, you know, um, guard your integrity. You you. you Nobody can take it. You have to give it away. And so yeah. it's a, a key lesson But you know, but on his side, uh, you know, my, I'm going to say my grandma, I mean, she, they started, a, they immigrated here, you know, opened a, opened it. So it was a liquor store, opened the liquor store was a, had a whole entrepreneur, entrepreneurial bent then. So I, I think it runs into blood somewhere besides education and teaching. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Just crazy enough to think that you can change the world, right? Yeah. Why not? 
<laughs> oh, so uh, I'm a big learner. Um, I, I I think that you know as much information as we can put in and consume and kind of take what we need at that moment in time. So, do you have any books, podcasts, or any any resources that are kind of like your go to that you think would be a good recommendation for our listeners and viewers? Oh, you know, I'm a uh... I, I try to consume as much as possible. So, um, you know, um, they're, they're, gosh, a handful of great podcasts, some, some in the, some in the health space, but, um, I would say if you're, you're kind of a tech oriented person, you know, the A16Z is a good one. Yeah. It, first of all, people should be listening to your podcast. So that, that's, Oh, a, well, I thank you for that plug. <laughs> is Andreessen Horowitz. They, they've had, always had a great series of podcasts from around different emerging tech. So that's a good one to kind of stay because it's hard. It's hard when you're focused on what you're doing to see what the rest of the world is doing. And, yeah. and sometimes you got to learn from adjacent space. And then um, I'm a big business wise. It's old school, but I love Drucker, Peter Drucker. I think there's nothing better than Drucker. And then um, there's a series of good, um, a series of good books on platform and platform business models. If you're interested in kind of, if your business model takes you that way, I think there's a good series there. Um, hope that made. Yeah, I think it is it uh, the one that I read recently is Platform Revolution. Yeah, well, there's one that's Platform Revolution. Um, the Tap Scots have a series of books on on blockchain revolution. So if you're interested yeah. in blockchain, those are good. Um, and uh, gosh, I have a couple here. So um, you know, the Machine Platform and Crowd Traction is a good one uh, for startups. In terms of kind of just understanding how you how you jam through some of the business side of life, I think those are all really good. So you know, our audience is um, a mixture of startups as well as you know large companies that are still innovating, whether it's you know within that big behemoth company, whether it's a separate business unit. So just kind of thinking about them in um, in mind, what advice or lessons learned do you want to share with them before we wrap up? Oh, don't be afraid afraid to fail you know, failure is not the end of the world. I mean, too, too often in, on the large side of life, on the large company side of life, you know, people view failure as, as uh, you know, putting their jobs at risk. But if, if you fail, if you fail um, rapidly or small little failures, you learn faster and you're able to have uh, greater and bigger successes. So don't, don't be afraid to try and don't be afraid to challenge the norm. From the startup side, same same thing. I mean, it's all about it's all about um, getting out there and trying and learning and trying again. Um, failure. I've learned more from my failures than I have from my successes, and just don't ever shy away from them. You know, I'm so glad that you brought that up. I was just writing about that this week. And, you know, one of the things that I find fascinating is we talk a lot about, oh, it's okay to fail. Failure is the path to success, right? It's breakthroughs are found in failure. Um, but it's really hard to admit we failed. Oh, it absolutely is. Especially when it's like yesterday. Like if it's like five years ago, it's like, oh yeah, that was a failure, that thing I did five years ago. But man, it is so hard to be that transparent and vulnerable of like, yeah, I just fell down flat face, <laughs> flat faced yesterday. I mean, it's, I wonder like if there's any science between how much distance do we need for us to feel comfortable and saying, yes, I failed. But you know, I don't know. I, I mean, <laughs> I just know that people who jump into startups don't like to fail. I yeah, mean, that, that's the nature of life, and um, and we all tend to be overly critical of ourselves. You know, and probably our, our own worst and harshest critics at, at times. And sure. there's actually, I think, a level of insecurity that um, that is a motivating driving factor. You know, that insecurity to prove people wrong or to say I'm right or or to really uh, to really achieve achieve a milestone because you said you can. And, and so when, when something happens, it changes that course is really hard to accept. I mean, um, you know, the, the little ones are easy, you know, well, okay, we, we tried that didn't work. Let's try this. It's the big ones that take, (laughs) take a while to, to really level set. And I mean, I, I, it took me a while even talk about my first big one and, you know, I had really successful company going, you had a crash in the early two thousands, a company just splattered and they ended up in, in some pretty significant debt at, at the end of that, even though we were able to sell some of the tech and 
Boy, it took, it took me, it literally took me years to recover to kind of regain confidence. It should have been a lot faster, but um, you know, that's kind of the, the perils of youth, I guess, being young and naive at times. And, um, but again, it's part of life, right? Part of being ever does right? Perfectly. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it's, I, I think it's ironic because, you know, like if I'm pitching an investor, I'm pitching a prospect, a customer, you know, we, we tend to think that if we say that we have all the answers, we have it all figured out um, and we've got it all put together, that that's going to make people have confidence in us and trust us. And then we're going to be able to win and we're going to be able to move forward. And what I've found in life is actually the more honest I am, I mean, I'm not making up failure stories. They've got plenty of real ones, but the more transparent and honest I am about what I don't know and about those failures, it it actually deepens trust and deepens um, credibility much more than if I was trying to put on a perfection facade. Well, you come across a lot more genuine. I I know, I know um, this just style of our little company is that I always tell people, don't be afraid when you're interacting with a customer, don't be afraid to say, hey, we don't do that. Or we're not good at that part of it. We're good at this part. Um, because at the end of the day, they're going to find out anyway. And, you know, when they're interacting with you and you you can be honest about yourself. And I'm not, you know, there's a difference between um, being uh, being humble, but you can be humble with confidence, you know. Yeah, and right, right. <laughs> you have to be able to, to, to acknowledge those things. It's not a bad thing, you know. And, and in fact, people like, it's a lot of customers and, and people you work with find that pretty refreshing, you know, without having to stay so guarded all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. Well, thank you for your humility and transparency and candidness with us today. If any of our viewers and listeners want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Oh, you can, you can find me on LinkedIn. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn at, you know, Twitter's at F for Coda. Uh, or come find me at Burst IQ at BurstIQ.com, B-U-R-S-T-I-Q.com. Thank you so much for being with me today, Frank. Appreciate it. Well, Roxy, it was a pleasure. Had a, had a great time. Thanks for having me. You bet. Thank you so much for listening. I know you're busy working to bring your life-changing innovation to market, and I value your time and attention. To get the latest episodes on your mobile device automatically, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Thank you for listening, and I appreciate everyone who shared the show with friends and colleagues. See you on the next episode of Health Innovators.